Which brings us to tonight. Um, I am super excited because tonight uh, I have a, a man I consider a really good friend here, a partner in ministry. His name is Caleb Kaltenbach. Uh, Caleb led an incredible ministry, well, more than one across the country. Uh, and he and I connected, especially when he was in the Valley. Um, and then God led him to now a national ministry with national influence, probably international influence. And he wrote a book called Messy Grace, uh, which is a must read. Uh, and it deals with the situation of how do you hold God's truth and treasure that and also hold on to something that's not opposed to that, which is grace and love. And how do we do that, especially when we're talking with people who may be struggling with areas of sexual immorality or with LGBTQI issues. And uh, you know, it's never been a better time to get an answer to this. And Caleb has uh, an expertise in this because uh, God has prepared him for this. So Caleb, good to have you here. Man, thanks for having me. I think, like you said, we've known each other for years now, years, and it's always good to be with you and and Pam, and uh, hopefully we'll get back to Disneyland soon one day. Yeah, okay, so we're both, all, all of us are Disneyland fans and Star Wars fans, right? You represent Absolutely. Star Wars? Absolutely. I wore my Rise of the Resistance shirt because you were going to be here with us. That's right. I have my Mandalorian phone cover right here, so we're good. Okay, we're like covered. best show ever? Best show ever. Yeah. So creative. Yeah, I think it really, really is the best of all the Star Wars, best of maybe any show out there. Absolutely. Um, and so I love it too. And um, the thing is, uh, God has prepared you for where you are. He has led you every step of the way. Yeah. Um, and I would love for people to hear your story. I know they can read more about it, but I'd love to hear just some of it from yeah. you right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a quick snippet and we can dialogue about it or anything you want to ask about it. But uh, my parents uh, and I, when I was born, we lived in Columbia, Missouri. They were both professors at the University of Missouri. Missouri, Columbia, and some other uh, local colleges. They taught subjects like philosophy, law, rhetorics, uh, many subjects that would put other people to sleep if they read the textbooks, you know. Um, but uh, when I was two, they divorced, and both of them went into same-sex relationships. My dad never had one partner. He had several, um, and he was in the closet until later on. But my mom uh, got into a 22-year relationship with a psychologist named Vera. They moved to Kansas City, which is why I'm a ch diehard Chiefs fan. Uh, very happy about the Super Bowl this past year. Um, and my mom and Vera became activists. They joined the local board of directors for GLAD, uh, Gay and Lesbian Awareness Against Discrimination or Defamation. Um, growing up as a preschooler, elementary age, middle schooler, uh, they took me with them to uh, parties and pride parades and clubs and bars and campouts and house parties. And I mean, you name it, I was there. Activist events met several celebrities at some of my mom's GLAD activist events. And I remember this one uh, particular parade I marched in when I was in elementary school. There were all these quote unquote Christians holding up uh, signs on the street corners. And these signs said things like, uh, God hates you, no room for you, turn or burn. And if that wasn't offensive enough, they would spray water and urine on people in the parade, like my mom and her community and her friends. And as a, as a young kid, I looked at my mom, and I, I still remember this like it was yesterday. I, I said, why are they acting like this? And she said, well, Caleb, they're Christians, and Christians hate gay people. If you're not like them, they will not like you. And so I, I mean, I saw that proved time and time again as a kid. I saw Christian parents ignoring their young sons who were dying from AIDS. And I just thought, man, there's no way I ever want to be a Christian. And um, I, by the time I got to high school, I had no centered worldview, just Anything you want to do is cool, um, but I hated Christians, so I joined a Bible study to learn how to disprove the Bible. I went in as a fake ninja Christian and met Jesus and realized, he, thankfully, he's not like a lot of those followers and um, gave my life to Christ. And then I got baptized. I had to come out to my three gay parents as a Christian when I was 16 who wanted to be a pastor, and they ended up kicking me out of the house. Um, but eventually they let me back in. I went to Bible college and later on they found the Lord. So that's a kind of a brief snippet. Yeah. And your story has a lot more depth to it than it that. I, I mean, I know it does. Um, so let's kind of camp on a couple of things. Uh, number one, the sad thing is when you see Christians in the name of Christ being hateful. Um, you know, I, I think without a doubt that not only broke your heart, then it breaks your heart now. Oh, it, it does. It does. And uh, whether it's uh, hate, whether it's Christians or just people in general being hateful towards 
uh, somebody because of how they view their sexuality, how they perceive their orientation, whether it's uh, somebody being hateful because the color of somebody's skin or if somebody's a male or a female. Um, I think I was talking with my 13-year-old son today. We were cleaning out his locker in his middle school room and uh, thankfully returning all of his math textbooks <laughs> that I didn't want in my house anymore back to the school. And he was just talking about a lot of the unrest and things that they were talking about in their school. And he's like, why does there feel like there's so much hate? And I said, son, it's because we've forgotten that everybody has the same equal intrinsic value. Everyone is someone that God created and Jesus died for, no matter what, no matter what they've done. It does not mean that we agree with every decision that somebody makes, but it means that we never compromise love, ever, never. Yeah, oh, and that's so true. And you know, even you and I were talking a little ahead of time. I feel like we always have to lead with love, and it has to be genuine. Absolutely, you know? it does. And so that's, that's for sure. Now, the interesting thing, too, is you ended up leading your parents to the Lord. Mm. Uh, and they even attended church with you. They uh, did. When I, when I was in Dallas, Texas, they started attending the church I was preaching at. They moved down there to be closer uh, to my wife and our kids, because we were there for three and a half years before God took us out of purgatory and brought <laughs> us back to Southern California. But, um, but yeah, they started attending, and uh, people were kind and gracious towards them. Again, we did not agree with, you know, their decisions. I didn't agree with my parents' decisions to be in, in same-sex relationships, but that didn't mean that I didn't accept them. I think we have to learn that there's a difference between acceptance and agreement. And I think you'd probably agree. Acceptance is about loving somebody no matter who they are. It's what Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 38 and 48, you know, through 48. You've heard there was said, hate your enemy. I tell you, love them. If you only love those who love you, what reward will you get? But just because we accept somebody doesn't mean we agree with every decision they make. Yeah, and that's where the um, whole idea of messy grace comes from, mm -hmm. right? The book, and and uh, it brings that answer. By the way, it's personal to me, not because my son uh, struggles in the area of sexuality, um, but it's personal to me because he's an atheist, yeah. uh, you know, and actually a professor, interesting your parents' professors. But he needs to know, and he does know, I accept him, I love him, I couldn't be more proud of him. Matter of fact, he's flourishing in his career. Um, and, and so the only times I've had openings have always been when it comes to issues of the heart. Uh, and so I know, and I'm not going to get him in his head, uh, but I, I can wait for that heart moment. And But there's got to be a lot of love uh, around that. And I think that's true in any situation. Um, and so for all of you who are out there kind of wondering, like, how do Christians act or interact with people who maybe disagree with us on any way? It's always got to be, we could not, they, there's nothing they can do to get us to not love them. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we shine out for Christ about that would be really, really good. So um, let's start talking about what would you say, you know, is the best way for the church to handle this issue of, you know, people who are going to be coming to us and they're either struggling with same-sex attraction or they may not be struggling. They, they may think it's okay. So what would you say for me as a pastor for all of us? First of all, <clears throat> I think and I know you would agree with this and your staff would, but we have to make sure that number one, our churches are places that anyone can attend. It doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what you've done. Maybe if you're a Raiders fan. <laughs> um, but other than that, you should be able to attend a church like Crossroads. Um, you know, a church where the gospel is preached, where truth is taught in a loving way. Um, and I think number two, we have to make sure that we lead by example and that we are safe people where we are in relationships with people who are obviously strong believers, but also with people that have different opinions or people that may not be Christians. And, and not only uh, because we want to lead them to the Lord, but because we genuinely, as you said, love them, lead with love. We love people who are unlovable, not because we want to, but because God does. You know, loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, the application of that is to love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we show God that we love him. And so we've got to start there and make sure that anybody can attend. But, you know, just because a church is a place that anyone can attend, it doesn't mean that anyone can volunteer anywhere. I mean, even at Crossroads, can just anybody volunteer with student ministry, with children's ministry? No. Do you let just anyone up on stage to sing? Like, you wouldn't want me unless you're going <laughs> to close the church on the last day. 
you know, that's when you would want me up there singing or leading because it would be a catastrophe. Like you talk about end times. Um, midnight was already there if I'm up on your stage singing. And so, you know, sometimes we're like, well, if they come, you know, when should we have that conversation? You know, uh, when, when I, somebody in my life comes out to me, you know, when should I have that conversation? Here's what I found. Those conversations are usually not as helpful when they are forced, but when somebody comes to you and they have enough trust to confide in you and they say things like, I don't know what to do. I never thought this would happen. What would you do in this situation? I never thought he would leave. I never thought she would leave. Um, I'm out of options. Has this ever happened to you? Those are the times that I listen for when I'm like, okay, this is a time to share Jesus with someone. Now it's different if somebody is in a church and they get caught doing something and they're already in, uh, you know, under authority to the elders, but we're talking about people that are coming. We're talking about people that are in our lives that we love. Um, and so we've got to look for those cues to be able to share truth in a loving way. Yeah. And I, I um, I know we could go a long ways, um, on this topic, and I, I don't think it'd probably be the best place to go tonight, but I know you actually are helping churches wrestle through how they have true church discipline, um, because we have to. The, the yes. Bible calls for us to, di- you know, but that's for Christians. Yeah. Yeah, that's for the and, believers. And the goal of, of church discipline, as you would agree, you know, some people think of church discipline as, as punishment. It's not. It's for restoration. It's coming alongside of people and journeying with them. And too often, I think the reason why people automatically think, oh, church discipline, is because, let's just face it, so many churches don't do it biblically. So many churches don't do it in love. They abandon. Yeah. And so that, 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 that's what I think. So yeah, I do that full time now, and I don't know how it'd go, and i worked with over 70 churches so far. So there you go. Yeah, one of our values here is that restoration and redemption is always the goal. Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, if we always are, le- you know, in keeping that at the forefront of our mind, it's for, so someone who's not saved, uh, they're not a Christian, they have not made their commitment. Our goal is to have them come to know Christ. But someone who's fallen, you know, are a fallen Christian, we want to be able to say, how can we be a part of restoration and redemption? And, and be compassionate in, yeah. in the way that you help that person back up. You know, boundaries are important, but compassion has got to be in there. Like you said, lead with love. Yeah, oh, for sure. The other thing you said, because I loved it, you were talking about we need to be really good at building bridges, not walls. Right. And uh, so that's what I really picked up from what you were just saying. Um, So when you, because of the background you've had, you know, with uh, a a community that does think we hate them far too often, um, how do you feel like uh, we individually, people as a family, maybe, um, I don't even know if we want to keep, maybe I need to ask two separate questions, maybe in a family member, who's LGBTQI, um, how do we make sure, hold on to truth, and yet make sure we're building a bridge and not a wall? What would you say? Yeah, so I I would say the first thing is that we have to learn to be uncomfortable in our faith. And it doesn't mean that our faith is weak. It means that I think too often people, and please disagree with, and I'm being honest when I say this, disagree with me if you you don't agree with this, but I, I really think that a lot of people Um, A lot of Christians who sit out in the chairs when you preach uh, at your church, when I've preached or preach at the churches I preach at, I think to myself, there are a lot of people out there that have constructed this image of who God is in their head. And anytime God doesn't do something, it does something outside of that construct, they just ignore it because this idea that they have of God in their head fits their own world that they've constructed. And so I think we have to learn that Christianity, while there are absolute black and whites, you know, like Jesus is God, he's the only way, the Bible is inspired without error. I mean, you know, those are absolutes. There are a lot of things where there's tension, like God's sovereign, but there's free will. Um, You know, we live our life, but Jesus lives for us. One God, but the Trinity, grace and truth. Uh, you know, evil and death were defeated at the cross and the resurrection, not yet destroyed, right? So we have to live in the arena of time, which is tension. And within that tension, we have to understand that anytime we truly love somebody with sacrificial love, there will always be that tension where you feel like, man, I should be telling them more about the truth, or I should be 
more gentle on them, more compassionate. And, and here's what I tell people that, you know, if, if you've had a time with a friend or a family member to sit down with them and share truth and share what you believe the Bible says about uh, same-sex relationships um, or, sexual, or, or sexual relationships or intimacy in general, um, that's not a conversation that you need to keep beating them over the head with unless, you know, they want to continue the conversation. When you have it, it's important to know that you've had it and really focus on just loving them and being there because you want to be a safe person in their life so that when life crumbles down around them, they feel like, man, I can go talk to Chuck. He's always been honest. He's always been kind, even though we've disagreed. And you have that influence to be able to speak into my life when I've hit rock bottom. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And I totally agree. It's kind of interesting coming back to what we just said. You know, there is tension in the Bible and we can't get away from that. We shouldn't because it's God's God's truth is bigger than we are. Oh, but like God. in First Thessalonians five. And again, tell me if I'm wrong. In that same passage, it says, warn the unruly, but be patient with the weak. Yeah. You know, so you got to you got to know, wait, what what am I? What am I encountering here? Uh, is it someone being truly rebellious? Well, that I handle them one way. Um, and, and still with love, but maybe firmer. And then if it's someone who's just struggling and they're weak, they need kindness. They need gentleness. They need to be, uh, 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 you know, to have someone, you know, cr- cry with them. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'd like to say this, if, if, and I totally agree. And piggybacking off what you said, I'd like to say this, that to me, there's a big difference between somebody who is same-sex attracted, um, and somebody who is same-sex attracted and has decided to pursue other, you know, a relationship with somebody of the same sex. Um, a lot of people think, well, if somebody comes out to me, that automatically means that, they, they, that they're going to go into a same-sex relationship. Not necessarily. That's why it's important when somebody comes out to listen, to reaffirm your love, and just to be fully present in the moment. Yeah, no, I totally agree because, um, you know, Beckett Cook, who we had here, oh, he's, he's a friend of yours. Yeah, I love Beckett. You know, and, and Beckett, you know, said the Holy Spirit really did change him. Something happened in his life. And and so I don't want to ever quench or get in the way of what the Holy Spirit could do by by setting up, you know, again, building walls when we can really build bridges and do that. Yeah, and and Beckett's a, a great example. As Actually, I'm writing Messy Truth right now, and he is the opening story for my second chapter. Um, I begin by talking about how he dresses much better than me. I mean, he's (laughs) taller, he's thinner, he has more hair, he's obviously a villain, but he's a good guy. I I love Beckett. And so he's an example of that. Like, you know, Sam Alberry, Jackie Hill Perry, uh, Rachel Gilson, all these different people that are are great individuals. For whatever reason, God hasn't taken that away. They're still same-sex attracted. But that is not where the sin lies, okay? The sin lies in the decisions we make, right? Mm -hmm. And do we get into this relationship? If I consider myself to be a Christian, what does my devotion to Jesus require of me? And I think that that's a, that's a huge point. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I'm even uh, uh, sensing you're saying is we have to understand the difference between the temptation and the actual act. Absolutely. Because the temptation is not a sin. To be tempted is not a sin. No. The other thing is this, is it doesn't matter who you are, what your uh, gender is, what your um, orientation is, we all are told to flee temptation. Mm-hmm. So you flee temptation, I flee temptation. When I give in, we know it's God doesn't want you hurt, and sin always hurts. And so no matter what the issue is we're talking about, uh, there, there, it comes down to, you know, Jesus died for our sins, and we can be free, and we can change. Yeah, I- you know, I heard Andy Stanley say this one time in a sermon uh, years ago, and I thought it was so, so powerful, and it stuck with me. He said, every time you sin, it kills something in your life. Mm-hmm. And that stuck with me. It, and I think to myself, you know, sin damages the soul in ways that we don't know, and it takes a while to heal from it. And really, I think what it goes back to, Chuck, is I think it goes back at all of this. Uh, because for some, you know, God's grace isn't messy, but when it hits when his perfect grace hits our messy lives, it looks like messy grace. And, and that's how we can perceive it. That's what Jonah 4 looks like when he's sulking because God has saved Nineveh and God won't destroy them out of his love for them and compassion. And so I think to myself, man, what does this go back to? And I think what it goes back to is our identity, that we are made in the image of God. And I think that all of us 
our temptation is always going to be to repeat the devil's sin in heaven, to put ourselves on the throne of our life instead of God, to unseat him. And for a lot of people, their their messy grace, their temptation, that thing that is constantly at stake and comes against them may not be same-sex attraction. It might be their job. It might be the initials after their name. It might even be their family. It could be a person. There's always something fighting for our identity. And that's what it comes down to, I think, back to ultimately, is is Christ the main part of our main identity? Yeah, you know what? I totally agree with that, um, without a doubt, because um, your your wife actually has her degree in counseling mm-hmm. and does counseling. I do, too. And um, we know we're living at a time where people's identity is being assaulted over and over and mm. over again. We also know you can't be whole, you can't be healthy if you don't have a sense of identity. Right. And um, that's one of the things I get really concerned about for our next generation. I feel like we have, uh, we've, under, uh, we've had a, a, an intelligentsia underselling the need for identity, even though all the research shows you have to have good identity. You have to have good identity, identity and you have to have individualistic identity as well. And, I th- and my biggest problem with identity politics, I mean, yeah, everybody to some degree, we're all categorized into something. And, and I understand that, like, you know, middle class, upper class, whatever, uh, as far as income. But when identity politics begins to rule everything we are, all of a sudden we take on the group, the, the identity of a group and its offenses and everything else, we lose our individualism. And that, that is one of the most harmful things that we could ever do is to lose our individualism because God created us to be unique individuals through which he does extraordinary things. And when I, during this whole quarantine, one of the things I've enjoyed is not having to deal with so many identity politics, but it's slowly starting to creep back. Um, And I think that it's so damaging. And I think that this generation, Gen Z, the millennials and Gen Z as well, I think they are so prone to follow identity politics because identity politics does not rest on logic. It rests on emotion. And this is a generation that's driven more by emotion than logic. And those two things have to work together. Yeah. And also it's not based on the best science. That's no. the thing, you know, so you're yeah. right. It's, it is all emotional and it's a matter of fact, it's pretty, uh, it, the harm it's creating, uh, is, um, heartbreaking to me. Uh, and I know your wife's a part of helping people find healing in that. And you are too. Um, we got in a question that popped in. And I want to say uh, that I was very, very touched by this question. And, uh, and so to the girl who wrote it, um, she DM'd me, direct messaged me. Um, I want to say to you, first of all, if you're watching, and I think you are, uh, we love you. We value you. And I want to say thanks for trusting me with the question. Uh, thanks for being willing to ask it. Uh, but the question she asks is this, is what does God believe in bisexual humans or homosexuality? And she says, I love my church and I love God with all my heart, but will he understand me being bisexual? Um, and so Caleb, I'm going to throw that question to you. By the way, again, thank you for asking and thank you for being willing to wrestle this through with us. Because I want you to know everything we're about to say is because we care about you and anybody else dealing with something like this. Yeah, absolutely. And whoever, whoever wrote this, man, uh, thank you so much for the bravery to be able to ask this question. And um, what I say, I hope that God can use it to help. If not, I pray that you'd forget it. Um, but, but here's what I'd start off by saying. Number one, um, you know, God completely loves you. And he understands who you are more than what you know. And I think we need to be careful between God understanding who we are, because he does. He knows us better than we know ourselves. We need to be careful between understanding who we are versus God signing off on whatever we want to do. And I'm not indicating that's, that this person is doing that. I think to ask a question like this, that's, this is somebody who's really wrestling with it. Okay, But there are a lot of people you know, who use... God's understanding as leverage to be able to do whatever they want, despite what scripture says about relationships. And so, number one, yes, God understands you better than anything. And uh, God loves you um, more than what you know. At, At your lowest moment, God loves you just as much as he does now. So never doubt that. And he is totally in your corner and cheering you on. 
Um, as far as what does God think about sexuality from my study of the Old Testament, New Testament, especially of the New, I believe that God designed sexual intimacy to be expressed in a marriage between a man and a woman. Mm-hmm. And I think that even Jesus uh, backs that up when he talks about marriage in, in Matthew 19, when uh, 1 through 6, when the Pharisees ask him about divorce, and he answers, haven't you heard that God created them male and female you know, that for this reason, Genesis 2.24, a man will leave his mother and father, be united with his wife, then the two will become one. And so even Jesus himself, while he never said anything specifically about homosexuality, he did talk about marriage and sexual intimacy as well. And he was very protective of it. I mean, to the point where his view on divorce was so narrow, more narrow than people even today. And so I think to myself, if he had a narrow view on divorce, why would he have an open view on marriage? And I, you look at what Paul is dealing with, and yes, he's dealing with the Greco-Roman world, especially the Roman Empire, but um, you, you see throughout Scripture, you see God using women more and more as Scripture goes on. I mean, he always did, but you especially see him using women. You see God in the New Testament, you're under grace, you don't have to keep the 613 commands, but at the same time, love God and your neighbor is even more binding, I think. You know, you see, I mean, some people say that slavery became less and less. I don't think that God was ever actually for slavery. Oh, yeah. No, Never. Yeah. But I think he was saying in whatever circumstance you're in, try to leverage that to bring glory to God, to share Jesus with people. But you never see God whatsoever shift in any way on sexual intimacy throughout the male-female relationship in the Bible. And so that's why I believe that um, when we do engage in sexual intimacy outside of a marriage between a man and a woman, whether it's an affair, whether it's, um, you know, I'm hooking up with somebody, that's still engaging in sexual intimacy in a way that God did not design it to happen. And he's the designer. He is the one that gets to say how we do things. And that would be my answer. But that does not mean that God does not love you, that God is not for you, and and God knows your heart better than you do. Yeah, and I think that's a really good good teaching on the theology of sexual intimacy and what it's meant for between a man and a woman to bond together and communicate. Um, I'm going to jump on one other thing about that because I want to share something with you. And so, again, we're for you, but listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. It says, for this is the will of God. So it couldn't be clear. This is God's will for you and God's will for all of us. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Uh, And the word sanctification means you're special. So it's God's will for you to be special. It's God's will for you to live a life of sanctification, holiness that's very special and reserved because God values you that much. So he says, this is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Um, And so Caleb just brought out the only moral sex is sex in a marriage between a man and a woman. And he brought that out really well, uh, who are married, a man and a woman who are married. So for you, God has something better. And I want you to know that's how special you are to God. And right now, God wants you to know that he loves you, he cares about you, and he has so much more for you. And if you choose to live the way he wants you to live and love the way he wants you to love, then you're going to find yourself feeling special. And you're going to go back to what Kayla brought out earlier. You're going to know your identity, that your identity is you're a daughter of God, a child of God, a, a, a God who loves you as a dad. And so let God love you as a dad and don't get into things that are going to ruin your identity. Why? Because you matter too much. Don't get involved in acting out out in ways that are take away from how special you are. And so that's why God is saying, don't let that happen. And, and, and can, I, can I add something to that? Mm-hmm. I think that, and, and I know Pastor Chuck has probably preached on this before, but it, it's kind of interesting that the church and I know marriage is important, but spend so much of its time talking about marriage and society spends so much of its time talking about sex and both those things are not going to be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've often wondered why, and I could be wrong, but you know how when Jesus died, it brought to an end of animal sacrifices. Well, I think when you have the church finally being united with Christ and you have that marriage, just like the cross brought to an end all animal sacrifices, this brings to an end the need for marriage 
There's no more because marriage was as much a foreshadowing of Christ and his relationship with the church as animal sacrifices were to Jesus. And so that's why I think that there will be no need for sex or marriage in heaven. That's why Jesus says it's not going to be there. And so I would really implore the person that asked this question as well as anybody else listening, do not spend so much of your time on this earth with the few years that you have focusing on things that will not even be in eternity. That's a good thought. That's a good thought. Okay. So Jackie Tin on Church Online asked this. She asked two questions, both of which would be good for you to answer. She said, to be tempted is not a sin, but if you think it, if you think process the, the, the thought in your mind, is that a sin? Well, obviously, thought life can be sinful. Um, and I, and <laughs> that, that's a great question, and that's a hard question. The reason why it's a hard question is not because it's an unanswerable question. It's because it depends on the individual, and it depends on the thought, because you can spend so much of your time if you start dwelling on something and just dwelling on it and dwelling on it, then yeah, that's sinful. But if you're tempted and you're like, no, you try to move away and then it comes back, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep on trying to keep my focus over here. That's different, mm-hmm. I think. And so it's kind of a line there, but um, usually I, I know the difference. I know when I'm when I'm sinning and you know when I'm not, when it comes to my thought life, when I'm dwelling on something or when I'm imagining somebody that does not belong to me as my wife does, uh, when I'm imagining them in a way that's inappropriate, yeah, that's sinful. If I notice somebody who's, uh, you know, very beautiful, I don't think that's sinful, you know? I mean, numerous people, they look at me and they think that. They look at me, they think Zac Efron. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I'm used to it. I I get it all the time. This is eye candy. Um, and then the second question, you know, uh, if, if you've been hurt by the church, you know? Um, yeah, go ahead and read her question. If someone has been hurt by the church in the past, how can they overcome that and renew their passion for the church and desire uh, attending again? I, I would say this. Realize that uh, the words and actions of some Christians do not, number one, reflect God's feeling towards you, nor does it speak for the majority of Christians, um, many Christians I know are great people. They are fallen people, mm-hmm. but they're great people. And yeah, there, there are Christian jerks out there. You know, I've seen them. They're online. They're on Facebook, especially, and more so on Twitter nowadays, it seems like. But the fact of the matter is, is that you've got to remember that one does not speak for everyone, nor does one speak for God. Uh, and you have to trust what Jesus says about you more than what anybody else says about you. That's number one. Number two, you've you've got to move past your fear and you've got to start attending. I think right now is a great opportunity to uh, attend Crossroads online. And it's really a non-threatening way to do that. And then number two, you got to learn how to trust again. And the only way that you learn how to trust again is to give somebody the opportunity for you to trust them. And it's hard, it's difficult, but you have to keep on doing it. And you have to keep on doing it knowing that in any relationship you get in, you're going to be hurt by that person multiple times. This is what we humans do. We hurt each other, unintentionally even so. Yeah, I have been hurt by Christians and by church leaders. Yeah. You have been hurt mm-hmm. by Christians and church leaders, but you still love the church. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think part of that is forgiveness. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Martin Luther King is very famous for saying that um, forgiveness is a must because if you do not forgive your enemies, how can you love your enemies? You cannot love someone you've not forgiven. Um, We are commanded to forgive. It does not mean we always have to trust and be close with an individual again, but we cannot transpose one person or a few people's actions onto a whole group of people. That's not fair. Yeah, and I think the thing about it is, uh, for me, I always remind myself, number one, I don't want to be judged by the standard I'm judging others. Remember, Jesus said not to do that. By the standard of judgment, you judge, you will be judged. And um, the other thing is, the reason Jesus died on the cross is because people sin. So I sin, you sin. And when I've been uh, sinned against, uh, I know, actually, I, you and I sat through wrestling through one moment you had like that. Uh, your first question is, wait a minute, where am I at fault? I don't want, I don't, I don't want to pick up stones. Yeah. It, and then when I come to know, okay, I'm not at fault. But you know what? Can I be caring? Can I be forgiving? Can I not be bound by what someone else did? 
Um, so your mom ends up becoming a Christian and letting go of the hurt that was caused by people who called themselves Christians. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, and I, and I think it was a process. I think it still is. Uh, you know, my mom and I, we have an okay relationship right now, but there's family drama as there is in any family. And so that's kind of made it difficult. But at the same time, um, you know, it has just taught me over and over again. Uh, sometimes forgiveness is a one-time decision. Many of the times when you're really hurt, uh, forgiveness can be a process of days, weeks, months, or even years. And you have to keep on forgiving. And, um, you know, because here's kind of to what you alluded to. I don't like who I become when I don't forgive. And I don't like what I do to people I care for. And I don't like how I represent Jesus when I don't forgive. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you know as a pastor, and you know also um, uh, because your wife's training and you're also doing counseling with people, how many people are walking in, and they're living in bondage to a past pain. Uh, and it very often, very, very often, that's a lack of forgiveness. Not always. Some people have been victimized, so that's not, I, I know that. If you're watching, we know that's different. Um, but uh, we know that when you don't forgive, then in the end, you pay the price. So that old saying, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you're holding the grudge, it's like you drinking poison and hope the other person will die. It's just not going to happen. It's poisoning you. Yeah, yeah. And, and we are trying to enact justice on somebody else. And only God knows what appropriate amount of justice and, and mercy is required in every situation for people involved. And so one of the biggest things I think we humans have had to learn to learn to do, and we spend our whole life learning it, is to let go of things that we cannot control. We cannot control somebody else. Mm -hmm. I can control my emotions and my love. That's why I think Paul wrote in Romans 12, 18, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so forgiveness is a choice to believe that God is better at justice and mercy than me. It's also a choice for me to let go of trying to punish someone that I can't control. Yeah, oh yeah. And I, I think that when I start thinking about the whole issue, or, or the whole a teaching the Bible gives on forgiveness is that, you know, so I need to forgive others. I need to forgive myself sometimes. Yes. Um, you know, so many of you out there, um, and, and I'm only saying this because we know it's true. You know it's true and it's true. So many of you out there need to know that, you know, God not only wants to forgive you, he wants you to forgive yourself. And he wants you to live a life apart from sin letting go of sin. Jesus died so it wouldn't define you. It wouldn't determine your actions and who you are. Uh, you, you know, earlier you're, you were actually lovingly telling uh, the person who asked the question, look, don't live in that sin because now you're letting it define who you are. And we don't want that for you. God doesn't want that for you. It's way bigger and better what God has for you. No, it is. It is way bigger and better. And um, we, I think we truly reflect Jesus when we forgive, because that is the centerpiece of our faith. Without forgiveness, we are not saved. Yeah, oh yeah. When we forgive, we imitate Jesus. If there was anybody who had the right not to forgive, it was Jesus, because he was innocent, and yet he still forgave. So if Christ forgave me, even altruistically, forgiveness is something I can pay forward. And it may be hard, but you know what? Sometimes I think to myself, I'm only as strong as the last thing I surrendered to the Lord, and I'm only as strong as the last person I forgave. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and uh, there was an old saying, I forgot even who said it, that the person you love the least is the most you love Christ, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, that, that's sobering and mm -hmm. true. Um, but we want to be that way. We want to be the kind of people. And it comes back to where we even started. You want to build bridges. You want to lead with love. You want to care for people. Absolutely. And so we hold truth. And yet we hold on to love and they're not, they may be at tension, but they're not incompatible. Oh, and, and, you know, I usually, I don't have it, but I have this rubber band where I say, if you hold a rubber band by one side, it's grace. If you hold it by the other side, it's truth. But when you stretch the rubber band, that uncomfortable tension there is what we feel. And that's love. Love is the tension of grace and truth. And it builds a bridge. You see, society wants us to believe in false dichotomies. Like, okay, so if you don't, agree with same-sex relationships, and that means you're a bigot. That means that you are hate, hateful. Or if you believe and agree with same-sex relationships, you're not. Well, that's a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. You know, tension allows there to be a bridge. It allows conversation and dialogue. It allows people to walk back and forth. 
um, when we eliminate tension, um, we lose more than what we know. I mean, Jesus came full of both grace and truth, and he handled it perfectly, but we're flawed, sinful human beings. So, but we have to learn to live in the tension. Yeah, and I, I really believe that's true, too, without a doubt. Um, because there is a complexity to Scripture. I hear people go, the gospel's simple. Well, the gospel's simple, the Bible's not. Right. Yeah, the, and, and neither yeah. are people. Yeah, and there, for sure people aren't, yeah. People are complex. And, and that's why I think, you know, going back to the church discipline thing, when is it right to confront someone, that kind of thing. I mean, there are some church polity questions to ask. Is this person a member? Do they identify with a church like Crossroads or wherever they're attending? Are they still checking it out? That kind of a thing. Are they believers? Are they not? But really, what it comes down to is when is the right time? It, it, it depends on the person. It depends on what's going on. And that's why I say it's usually best to have these conversations when you really know and have a good relationship with someone. And that's different from preaching the truth up on stage. But when you're having a personal conversation with someone, hopefully you've built up enough empathy to where you know how you can say things in a way that they'll hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's incredibly, incredibly important. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. I, I mean, no doubt about it. So one of the things we want to do as we close is um, I, we want to say that if you, for some reason, are not in a situation where you're living God's will for your life, uh, you can. Uh, people can change. Uh, but that's a part of what you've been doing is helping people understand they can change. Uh, you know, we talk about Beckett. You know, everyone uh, went, you know, have a hard time believing, you know, that Beckett genuinely could could change. And yet he did. And he's so much happier. Yes. Uh, yeah, today. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't have times when he struggles. And he and I have talked about that. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't have temptation. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have loneliness. But uh, Sam Alberry talks about this in his latest book, which is a great read as well. It's called, and it's good for people who are heterosexual or people who do not relate is that way. It's called, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? And it's so powerful. And one of, the, one of the points that he makes there in one of his chapters is he talks about how within the church, because there is a focus on marriage, and, and that's not a bad thing, and also in society because of the focus on sex, we see sexual intimacy as the coup de grace of intimacy, and we forget that God has created so many different ways for us to experience intimacy. It doesn't mean that we won't be lonely, you know, but it doesn't mean that we have to be alone because there are so many different ways to experience intimacy through friendships, experiences, that kind of thing. And even being able to have that conversation with Beckett, I think is, has been powerful. And more than anything, his intimacy with God has just deepened. He's one of the strongest, most faithful people that I know and has a faith, and I don't mean this in an insulting way, I mean that I think his faith is stronger than mine, that it's a childlike faith. And I'm like, Lord, help me to be like Beckett, but am I willing to live a sacrificial life in the way that Beckett has? That's the question. Yeah, deny self. You mm -hmm. know, Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, they have to deny themselves, take up the cross and follow me. And so, you know, I remember we were talking with Beckett, and, and I um, had a bunch of people said, you got to ask him, you got to ask him, you know, uh, you know, how hard is it? And, and he said, you know what, there are times it's hard. But the one thing he said is people don't realize how great Jesus is. Absolutely. <laughs> he goes, the minute you know Jesus, like, yeah, there's struggles, but those don't compare to what Jesus has for you. And Chuck, my hope throughout this whole quarantine season, stay at home orders is I've been encouraging people that I know, uh, you know, and I lead my volunteer time at Shepherd Church, a sister church of Crossroads. I lead a high school small group uh, every Wednesday. And I've been encouraging them, guys, use this time with a few distractions to deepen your intimacy with Jesus, yeah. to build into it. Because I feel like Chuck, man, there's so many of us, we're going to squander it. We're going to be worried and up, spend all of our time upset. And, and rightfully, there are some people that, that should be upset that horrible things have happened to. I have a friend whose 15 year old son died by suicide, you know, four weeks ago. He's a pastor at North Point. And I mean, that, that's awful. Um, but the vast majority of, of people, average American, use this time. What little time you have left to focus on your relationship with God. Who do you want to be on the other side of this? Who can you be for Jesus? Oh, for sure. 
And so I want to say to everybody out there, there's one thing that um, has been said more than once that um, Caleb brought up that we don't want you to miss. And that is uh, the real thing you're made for, the, the thing you're made for is intimacy with Christ. Uh, God loves you so much, you're not an accident. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He has a plan for your life and a purpose for your life. And he has one that's amazing and good. Jesus died on the cross so you would be set apart, so you'd be special, so you'd know how valuable you are to God. So if right now, for some reason, you're not experiencing that, so right now, if you're not living in God's love, right now you're not experiencing a real relationship with him, you can have that. Uh, you can have it because Jesus said that if, you, uh, uh, if any man uh, comes after me uh, and takes up his cross and follows me, then he's going to have a relationship with him. Jesus said that he stands at the door and he knocks. And maybe right now, for some of you, Jesus is knocking. Maybe right now, something's happening in your life. And he said, if you would open up to him and, and allow him to come and be with you and love you and fill you with his spirit, that you would start to discover life in a way that's beyond measure and beyond description. So I'm going to invite you right now to make a decision for Christ, maybe for the first time to open up your heart. You know, how do you how do you open up to Jesus? Well, if someone knocks at the door, what do you do? You say, come in. So I'm going to ask you to say to Jesus with me a prayer where you invite him to come. You invite him to love you. You invite him to free you from past hurt and past pain and past shame and guilt. And it will allow you to live in a present that's amazing and good. And what we'll do is we'll pray a prayer together where you do that. Again, you can pray it for the first time. You can pray it to recommit your life to him by just saying, Lord, I want you to take me back. Because some of you out there, it's not a first time decision. It's a come back to Jesus decision. Maybe you've been giving into things you shouldn't. He loves you. Come back to him. Come back to him. So I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. And then one of the things Jesus wants you to do, he wants you to make it known. Whenever you pray a prayer like this, you don't keep it private. You make it known. And so a powerful way for you to do that, a life-changing way for you to do that, is to right now grab your phone, get your phone or your computer or your iPad. And I want you to go to the message section and I want you to text amen to 69922. I want you to text amen to 69922. And then we're going to text you back. I want you to know that we're never going to share your information uh, in a way we shouldn't. But we're going to text you back so we can start to get to know you so we can get some things to you to help you grow in your love for God, to help you experience this life with God, to help us be able to pray for you better and watch over you and, 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 and share things with you so you can be a part of our church family. So right now, is he calling out to you? Right now, are you ready to say yes to him? If so, get ready to pray this prayer with me. But right now, go ahead and text amen to 69922 so that we can share this time together. Again, you could pray it for the first time. Maybe the Lord's stirring in your heart that this is a time to get free from something, something that's hurting you, something that's harming you. Maybe it's something inside you you don't like that's going on. Maybe Maybe it's a past hurt or pain and you're carrying the grudge from it. And forgiveness hasn't been easy. Maybe you can't forgive someone else. You can't forgive yourself. Pray this prayer and find freedom. We really, really want this for you. We really care about you. But I want to tell you, as much as we want this for you and care about you, God wants it more. God loves you more. And so I'm going to ask you to pray it. And so you can pray it alone. You can pray it as a couple. Uh, you can pray it as friends. You can pray it as a whole family. So right now, let me pray for some of you right now. I'm going to pray that God would touch you. If you love God, pray for people to say yes to him. So let's pray. Father, right now, I pray for anyone out there who just needs your love. They need to know their identity in you is that they are they're meant to be your children and they can now become a child of God or they're a child of God who's far away, they can come back. So I pray right now, Lord, for them to be ready to say this prayer, ready to call out to you, ready to experience more, ready to experience your love. Lord, we want this. We want this for them. And while, Lord, I know right now you know them by name and right where they sit, they matter to you. I pray they could feel it. I pray they could feel your spirit and feel your love and know, Lord, there's nothing they could ever do that would keep you from loving them. But, oh, there's so much you have for them if they would commit their life to you. So I right now want to pray for the people who are, are just feeling moved and even texting in. And, and they're letting us know. They trust us enough to let us know it's them. And, Lord, as they begin to pray this prayer and they begin to make that text, they God, they could feel something powerful going on. 
So right now I'm going to lead that prayer. And if you're ready to say yes to God, I want you to pray it with me. So pray these words, say these words, either say them out loud or whisper them. Say, Lord Jesus, I know you love me. And I know you died on the cross for me and you died for my sins. I pray you'll forgive me. I pray you'll cleanse me. I pray you'll heal me. And I pray, God, you'll set me free from anything that would hold me back or make me not realize the life you want for me. I pray most of all, you'll make me yours. And I pray you'll make me alive. And I'll pray you'll make me brand new. So I say yes to you. And if that's the only words you can pray, say those. Say, I say yes. Right now, just say it. I say yes. I say yes to you. And I say yes to the life you have for me. So take me now and make me yours. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen if you pray that prayer. Praise God. But be sure to text us. You know why? Something powerful happens when you make it known. And I want to tell you, when you text that amen and we get back to you, you're going to feel something deepening in your commitment to God. And so we really want you to do that right now. So let us know who you are. And for those who have, praise God for you already doing that. Uh, I do want to say, Caleb, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, man. Seriously. Yeah. And I love our friendship and I love the ministry you have. Messy Grace is available at Amazon. uh, So you can go there to get it. Uh, And it's a great book. Love for you to pick it up. I'd be a good thing to read during this season where we're going into the summer and need summer reads plus the quarantine. So Messy Grace is available right now too. Right now, Casey's going to have some closing thoughts. So take it away, Casey. Well, congratulations to all of you who made a decision to follow Jesus or be baptized today. And if you did text us to make that decision, be sure to reply with your name so we can send you a special gift. I also want to invite you to gather your family and friends to be a part of our family by joining us right here online again next week. We are live on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. or Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11. So if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our messages. And if you found yourself thinking, I wish so-and-so was watching this right now, then hit that share button and send it to them so they can also be encouraged. And finally, if your life is being impacted by Crossroads and if you want to be a part of making an impact around the world, you can text GIVING to 69922 to make a financial gift today. Well, thanks again for watching. We'll see you again next week.